Good evening, everyone. My name is Cody Becker, and I'm a first-year graduate student at the McCourt School of Public Policy. It's been an amazing year participating in programs hosted by GU Politics. I first got involved with them last semester through the Fellows Program. I started as a member of the student strategy team for Fall 2023 Fellow Nia Malika Henderson, and I'm currently the team lead for Spring 2024 Fellow Michaela Carr. Michaela served as former Speaker McCarthy's Chief of Staff and General Counsel. By working with Michaela, I've learned so much about the ins and outs of congressional work at the highest level. Having the opportunity to converse with her regularly and hear some rarely shared insights from one of the Hill's most senior staff has been truly unique. Growing up out just outside of Seattle, I wasn't always exposed to opinions other than ones similar to my own. But by coming here to this city and this school, and by finding programs like GU Politics, I've been able to expand my worldview and welcome opinions that were previously foreign to me. This, to me, embodies the spirit of democracy and exemplifies what GU Politics' mission is all about. And with that, today, it is my pleasure to introduce former Speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy. Kevin McCarthy served, oh no, hold on. Kevin McCarthy <laughs> served as the 55th Speaker of the House of Representatives. He was the U.S. Representative for California's 20th Congressional District from 2007 to 2023. He served two terms as a member of the California State Assembly before being elected to the U.S. House in 2006. McCarthy served as the House Republican Chief Deputy Whip from 2009 to 2011, and as House Majority Whip from 2011 to 2014. In 2014, he was elected House Majority Leader and later served as House Minority Leader as well. He was elected to the Speakership in January of 2023. Following his remarks, the former speaker will take your questions in a discussion moderated by Mo Elithi, Executive Director of GU Politics. You can join the conversation on social media by tagging at GU Politics and by using hashtag McCarthy at GU. Now, please join me in welcoming to the stage Mo Elithi and former Speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy. Hoya Saxa, everybody. It's a great crowd this close to the end of the semester. I think I was at the tombs this close to the end of the semester when I was a student here. Um, thank you all for turning out. Mr. Speaker, thank you for, for joining us, for coming back to Georgia. And you spent some time here. Thank your, you for having me. Your son graduated a few years My back. My son graduated in 2016. I spent a lot of time at Toons, too. <laughs> um, everybody goes there on their 21st, too. Get the stamp, midnight. All right. I'm near 21st, yeah. Um, <laughs> ID, AI, <is> help. <laughs> uh, well, thank you for being here. Um, as we were talking about backstage, a big focus of the Institute this year has been around the topic of trust in democracy. And we're seeing poll after poll after poll um, that shows Americans and not just Americans, people across uh, Europe, Latin America, are losing faith in the institution of democracy. The Associated Press had a poll just last week that shows uh, only three in 10 Americans believe that our nation's democracy is functioning well. And our own poll taken last month says that 81% of Americans believe that democracy is actively under threat. And so I wanna dig into that a little bit tonight. I've got some thoughts on that that I'm gonna to wanna to ask you about, but I also wanna hear yours. We're gonna have a conversation for a little bit, and then about the halfway mark, we wanna invite all of you to join in the conversation. Um, as always, um, the speaker has graciously agreed to, to take student questions as well. But I want to start there before I start throwing out my theories. Why do you think American trust in democracy is that low right now? Well, first of all, thank you for being here. Spend some extra time. Um, I think there's a number of reasons. You've got to think about democracy itself. Um, it is still the greatest form of government because we the people get involved. But it was designed, democracy itself is not fast, 
It's not overly efficient in certain manners. And there's reasons why people start having lack of trust in it. You can go all the way back and you say people stop. The start happened after uh, the Pentagon Papers during the Vietnam War. Because you used to really trust your government at 72. Not democracy, but it's your government, right? You've got social media. You've got no longer do we just have three TV stations that provide you news. We now have, you can go home and you can get your news from an outlet that philosophically agrees with you. So it doesn't matter what position you take, and it doesn't matter if you're Republican or Democrat, or, or am I more progressive, or am I more far right, I go to Newsmax instead of, instead of Fox. I can go to MSNBC instead of the others, right? And when they're providing, they're not providing news, they're providing opinion. So you're not hearing somebody's working well together or others. And then, how effective has Congress and the Senate been in the last little bit? So it adds and compounds it, right? And then social media adds a whole other aspect to it. Then I would say from this perspective, um, there's a number of other reasons that made people begin to question, right? You slowly have had, um, since the year 2000, you've had every time a Republican ran or, or won a presidency, for the first time, it got challenged on the floor. Then you had Republicans challenge the last president, and you had the January 6th. But you've had that go on in governor races and others. So it's something that you, you wouldn't pick up on it when it first hits, but it goes. Then we had COVID. So anytime something like COVID happens is like a once in a hundred years or others. And those really go to the power of democracies itself. If you, if you historically study, if somebody is a leader during an incident like a COVID and it's a democracy, you will lose. Because it's so, it's so changing of yourself and to the institution itself. The only real leaders that sustain themselves are dictators. And if you watch around the globe, that's kind of played to be true. But something happened during COVID that this is inside politics. I'm a firm believer that structure dictates behavior, okay? When COVID hit, we didn't know what it was. And so the world didn't know what it was, right? But we're trying to react as policymakers at the same time. So in Congress, the next thing they did, they started supplying it. And they thought it was good. I was opposed to it. What they would call um, a proxy voting, okay? And it was only going to be used if you had COVID. So you, couldn't, so you didn't have to fly to vote. But we didn't want to, you didn't want to lose your vote so you can vote by proxy. You would think that's probably a pretty good idea. I, I was opposed to it because I thought it would be taken further. Then they keep it even though we're past COVID. But you know how people would use it? It didn't matter if you had COVID. You just signed a piece of paper. There was a person at a, some movie star's wedding in in France. There was a guy voting on a boat on vacation, and he phones in, right? And, and it just took itself, but this is what happened with it. Members weren't talking to each other. And then because of COVID, they made a special rule that bills don't have to go through committee. And in Congress, you work all this time to get on the committee of that jurisdiction, because and then bill goes around, and then you fight hard for it, and people, you, you lose because some people are home and they're voting another way. How serious are they looking at it? So it compounds all of that um, in there. And so you don't have a news provided. This is the information backing behind. You have opinion that's going to go from one side to the other. You have social media that's providing something very quickly. There's no editor in charge of what somebody says. I mean, I've, been in, I've seen a lot of things printed, and I'm sitting in the room, and I thought, none of that transpired. You've got people challenging presidential races and others on both sides of the aisle. Now, Technically, they have the right to do that. But now we've just become where, no matter where we are, we, we don't, the United States of America refers to states as red or blue. And they define you all that way. Um, so it's not just the trusting of a democracy. Do you trust your bank? D do you trust people down the street? But, but you'll judge them. I mean, how many times do you hear somebody say, oh, I don't trust them because that person is a different party than I am, right? I mean, I remember when my kids would come back and if they got a bad grade, oh, teacher doesn't like you, your politics, dad. No, or you just didn't do it right. What, which one is it, right? <laughs> um, there's an interesting, just as an aside, 
uh, a poll that gauges, you know, asks people, I would be upset if my child married outside my fill in the blank, faith, race, political party. And for the first time over the past few years, political party exceeded race and faith. Now, I guess that's progress. But it's. I've, I've, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I guess it'd be. Yeah. <laughs> right? But I just find that nuts in many ways that, that people, to your point, that people have that kind of visceral reaction based on someone's. But even, even if you took people within their own party and you asked them to find what your party stands for, they couldn't agree. And they would fight among themselves. It's not, it's not like we have two parties in America. We don't have two parties in Congress. I think we've got like five or six different yeah. parties in Congress. And if I just had my own party that had eight people not in it, I'd still be speaker. Well, we're going we're gonna to get to that. <laughs> we're going to get to that. You touched on a lot of things that I want to get to here. Um, I, let me start. You just talked about people challenging elections. So let's start with trust in elections. In our most recent poll, about 60% of people have some level of doubt that the 2024 election will be held fairly. And about half of those really have absolutely, they feel completely certain that it will not be held fairly. And so let's go back to 2020 for a moment. Mm -hmm. Do you believe Joe Biden won that election? Yes. OK. So can you explain the rationale behind your vote mm -hmm. on January 6th regarding certification of the election? OK, remember what certification of election is, and remember what 2020 happened. What happened prior to 2020? COVID. Have we ever had an election during COVID? OK, what transpired with COVID? Well, with COVID taking place, states just like Congress started doing their balloting different, right? So you had California said, I'm just going to send everybody a ballot. You had people in Pennsylvania making decisions and not the state legislature, if you look at the Constitution, who can make these changes. So is it fair if you go to a Pennsylvania, but one county lets you correct the ballot and another county does not. The only time you have to question, and let's be very honest with everybody else, if I was successful in my vote for challenging that last election, who would be president today? Joe Biden. We get elected by electoral college. We never objected to enough votes that would change the outcome. But that's not the same case to the election that transpired in 2000, when the Democrats objected, or to 2006. So the problem being is you see this progress over time. And what would Nancy Pelosi tell you when they first objected? She said, this was your only time to do it. It's the role of the, of the government. But you had this COVID on top of it. I mean, the challenge that I had, we didn't challenge in California, else, but if you're from there and everybody got a ballot and people moved so often, homes were getting the last four families who lived there because they didn't clean up their roles. I mean, if you look at LA, LA has 1.2 million more people on the ballot that who are old enough to even register to vote there, a court challenge, because they don't clean the rolls. Then you, you transpire what happened in 2020, okay? In 2020, if you look at that election and you look at how close it was, Biden won that election by 48,918 votes. 48,918 votes. A lot of those states were very close. So the, to me, that's not a problem, especially when you're living in the world of COVID and people making others. It's your only time to question, did it happen? And in a democracy, one of the, one of the cornerstones of the democracy is your ability to question something. And if you don't question it, are you more likely to believe it or not? If you're denied that ability, then you're really going to assume, oh, it's crooked. So remember, we're coming off of also, you got the Bush Gore in Florida. Uh -huh. You've got coming in Georgia. You've got the challenge of the 2016 race. You've got Hillary Clinton, who said she won. You had Jimmy Carter, 
said that wasn't that Hillary won. You have Hakeem, the Democratic leader, said he Trump is an illegitimate president. Um, you have Biden who agreed with that. So you, you have built upon all of this, and then you have this unbelievable COVID experience where people literally changed election laws, legislatures couldn't meet. When else would you be able to raise the question? But in 2000 and in 2016, mm -hmm. Democrats, and uh, no, it's no surprise everyone here that, that, I'm, that I'm a Democrat. Democrats, sure, there were folks who challenged the election. They challenged Ohio. But, but in those cases, the Democratic nominee had already conceded the race. Mm -hmm. And it was a few people. It wasn't a majority of the Democratic conference that was doing it. And, and I just I bring up that distinction because in 2020, you had the incumbent was still actively trying to make the case that it was not over. And it, I think, fueled some of that number that I read. It fueled some of people's distrust in the elections. I'm not saying that everyone would have said everything is hunky-dory, but when you show that kind of a show of force and the incumbent is still pushing it, does that not feed some of that distrust? Yeah, I would say when Hillary still pushed it, it still pushed it too, but if they do. But she had conceded. No, she'll say today, I'll, I'll read you quotes where she said, you, could, you can run the best campaign, you can win, you can get the most votes and still not win. You have a former president, Jimmy Carter. You have, you have the president, Joe Biden, saying 2016 was stolen. You had a, a race for Georgia for a governor who said no. You had the former governor of Virginia, who's the DNC chair, questioning that election. So all of this builds upon itself. But the one point I would raise to you is, OK, so those who questioned the race when George Bush won challenged Ohio. Had they been successful, Bush would not be president. Had Republicans who challenged the 2020 race been successful in their two, chal two challenges, Joe Biden would be president. He wouldn't have the same electoral vote that came out, but challenging something doesn't mean you're overturning something. A challenge is a challenge. A challenge is, is there something wrong here? Can you answer the question? So that's the point that you raise. Now, a member of Congress is elected by themselves. It doesn't matter if somebody else says something else. Does help it fuel? I'm sure all that helps fuel. I'm sure it brought more votes. But remember where the country was at as well. We, we had been at this point, I remember Bush Gore, you and I would remember that. You would remember them storming in to the ballot. You remember them looking up the guy with the eyeball with a hanging chad. It went to the Supreme Court to make the decision. So I mean, these are all added into the question. Why are these all so close? And having COVID on top of it, I think raised the question higher. Let's talk about what happened in the middle of that day okay. and the assault on the Capitol, the insurrection. Um, I guess one of the things I still struggle with as I look at that day and the reaction ever since, honestly, mm -hmm. even up until today, are the number of people who are willing to excuse it, to apologize for it, with many of them, some high, very high profile people, referring to those people as hostages, the defendants as hostages. At a time when we're spending a lot of time talking about the rule of law, is that normalizing that kind of political violence, that kind of rhetoric? Well, look, I was a person who sat inside of January 6th. I got removed from the Capitol. They broke into my office, right? I didn't leave my office until they were coming through the window. What happened on January 6th was wrong. I don't apologize for any of the people who did it. Um, I don't think it was right in any shape or form. Um, I don't think it was right when we had a couple months before people protesting appointment to the Supreme Court and pounding on the door and trying to get in the Supreme Court. Um, I don't like the idea that after the fact that both sides try to 
politicize it and, and scream it into the way of their own beliefs and their own style. I mean, if it was truly you believed it was a bad event, why wouldn't you, as Speaker of the House, with everything else you've ever done, let the minority leader appoint the Republicans to investigate just as you got to appoint the Democrats? For the first time in history, when we went to perform, and who was the first person to ask to have a bipartisan commission like the 9-11 to look at what happened on January 6th? Me. <laughs> right after the days. You know what was interesting? And this is the other reason why you have a problem. I was the minority leader at the time, the sergeant of arms, the sheriff of the Capitol. Had I ever met that man? No. On that day, when they had warnings before with the FBI and everything else, you think he came to tell me, hey, to the members, hey, this could be a problem that day. Nope. But the person where the members can park in front of the Capitol, the parking attendant told members, hey, there could be a problem, don't there? But the sergeant of arms didn't warn any of us. When this transpired, when they literally had the guards move me out, you think the sergeant of arms ever called me? Maybe two days later. No. He reported to one person. He made the policing of the Capitol to be political. I mean, it, it drives down structure dictates behavior there. And that shouldn't be the case. And just like when Speaker Pelosi told me, no, I couldn't appoint certain members to the committee to investigate it, she would pick who could be. Well, how are you ever going to get to the bottom of what's true or not? And how do you start the premise with saying everything's open except the speaker's communications with the sergeant of arms that day? What type of answer are you going to get? If you really want to know the answer to the day. So what would you say to folks today who are downplaying what happened on that day or defending the people who stormed the Capitol? I don't know that they're defending the people who stormed the Capitol, but I think they're defending the due process for how long, if we're now sitting almost four years later, why are they sitting in jail and not having the, the ability to go to court? Are they being treated fairly? I, I think that's a, a greater question that I hear from people on the other side. Um, I don't want to spend, we've got a lot of material to cover and I keep getting the sign that we're going to move to student questions. Make it harder. So, so I want to talk a little bit about, let's talk a little bit more about Congress. Gallup's approval rating last month mm -hmm. showed 12%. It dropped on. It is now the lowest it's ever been. I'm 12, no longer speaker. What 12%. I, <laughs> I knew that would happen. Making that institute. <laughs> Making that institution, you know, maybe one of the few institutions that is less popular than both major party nominees for president right now. That's kind of hard. If, so let's talk about your experience. Upon winning the majority, running for speaker in that marathon. Any of you watched my race for speaker? Was it good TV? <laughs> okay, first of all, let me tell you this. I served 17 years, I loved every single day. I served speaker, it was tough, I loved every moment. The highest to the lowest. There's two philosophies I have. Every day I want to learn something new and I can never have too many friends. I, I w I'm a Republican, but I was not born into a Republican family, I was born into a Democrat family. My son went to Georgetown, but I had no ability to get into Georgetown. My, my family didn't have great wealth. Um, my father was a firefighter. He moved furniture on his days off. I was the youngest. When we got out of high school, they, I couldn't go away to college, so I went to junior college. But they instilled in me a work ethic. Well, I never give up. Now, I met this guy. He had a liquor store, and he'd sell his beer underage, okay? But he had a car dealer's license. And I lived in a city called Bakersfield, California. So I talked him into one day, I'll pay you 100 bucks if you take me to the LA car auctions. Because you've got to be a dealer to get in, right? To the big auctions where they all bring their trip. So I start buying and selling cars and flipping them to pay my way through college. It's illegal, but I don't know it why I'm doing it, all right? So if you're going to junior college, what do you do? You go visit your buddies who are away at college, right? So my best friend was at Stanford. My other one's SC in San Diego State. So this week I'm going to go visit my buddies at San Diego State. So I pick up my other friend. I go to the grocery store to cash a check so I have money for the weekend. Lo and behold, as I'm cashing this check, the day before the lottery started in California, so I bought a lottery ticket and I won the lottery. Could you believe that? But put yourself in my place. It's 1985. The most you was $5,000. This was before Biden inflation, so it was money. <laughs> but just a joke. 
Think about that. You're 20 years old, Friday night, you won 5,000 bucks, and you'll spend the weekend 10 minutes from Tijuana, right? Okay. So I come back, take my folks to dinner, give my brother and sister each 100 bucks. And another thing you learn about it is I love to take risk. I put the majority of the rest of the money into one stock. And I do pretty well. I make 30% of my money. So the next semester, I take a break from school. I go and try to buy a franchise, but no one will sell me one because I'm only 20 years old. But I don't quit. So I open my own deli. And I do pretty well, right? So in a two year, about two years, I now have about enough money that I can pay my own way through college as long as I go to Cal State. So I'm going to Cal State. The local paper says be an intern in Washington, D.C. with my local congressman. I don't know the man, but I thought he'd be lucky to have me. So I applied. And you know what he did? Sound like a Georgetown student. Yeah. <laughs> you know what he did? He turned me down. But you want to know the end of the story? I got elected to the seat I couldn't get an internship for, and became the 55th Speaker of the House. Only in America could that happen. Okay? Now, I got to be leader for five years. There were tough years for Republicans. In those, in those election years, the Republicans lost the presidency. They lost both cycles of, of the Senate, and we lost governors in the State House. But in Congress, we, lost, we won both times. And I'll tell you the moment I, really, I became leader. Um, Paul had left. President Trump did a State of the Union. And I go and I walk down on the floor. And you know what the State of the Union? We really go like Republicans on one side, Democrats on the other. Everybody wears a certain color. So they, one side stands up, the other side stands up, right? And I'm sitting there. And we had gotten a shellacking at that last election. And their side stands up. And it, it looks like you. It looks like America, from every different walk of life. I look over at us when we stand up, we look like the most restrictive country club in America. <laughs> and I kind of slumped down. I said, I'm either going to be the leader of a declining party, or I have to open this party up somewhere else. I'm very proud of the fact, in those two election cycles, we elected the most Republican women, the most Republican minorities ever before. And that's really our ability to win in places people didn't think of win. When I got elected leader, Pelosi got elected speaker. We both come from the same state of California. Donald Trump lost California by 5 million votes. Do you know how many, how many congressional seats did Pelosi add to her majority when she became speaker from California? Not one. She lost five. We won five. New York, Arizona, Washington. So the party found something different. And in, in my how I come to this party is really Abraham Lincoln, a Teddy Roosevelt, and a Reagan. You know, if you, you will find me in DC, I'll walk the mall, and I walk all the way down to Lincoln, I walk up, and I always read the Gettysburg Address. Four score and seven years ago, our forefathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated the proposition that we are all equal. In the, in the end, he says, but if we fail, government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from earth. Think from one moment what Lincoln was saying. Okay? We weren't the world power. We were fighting one another. But he knew we would sustain ourselves, the democracy of we the people. It's more powerful than anything else. So when you get down about democracy, remember. But the most important thing when he writes in there, conceived in lib liberty and dedicate the proposition that we're all equal. Name me one other nation in the world that's conceived in liberty. Right? We strive to be a more perfect union. We're not perfect. But we have an ability to do it that's always not pretty. So. When something goes wrong, we shouldn't say the whole system is wrong. We have a system that allows us to correct that, to improve in that. But we should be honest about what's wrong with the system and honest about really getting to the bottom of the answer. And if you have a democracy, don't think it's just elected officials that are going to solve the problems. It's all of us combined. So was it this? You made a lot of concessions. In oh, the negotiations. Oh, oh, I didn't. Okay. okay is that Let's get to the bottom of that. Right? That, no, 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 that is no, no, no. such a misnomer in life. Let me give you the truth about that now. <laughs> and I'll give you the truth why I'm not speaker. It's because one person, a member of Congress, wanted me to stop an ethics complaint because he slept with a 17-year-old. An ethics complaint that started before I ever became speaker. And that's illegal, and I'm not going to get in the middle. Did he do it or not? I don't know. 
but in ethics is looking at it. There's other people in jail because of it. And he wanted me to influence it. And you know what? So then they come out and they say, because I kept government open, I'd do it all over again. We're not going to pay our troops? No, I'm going to pay my troops. You can't do the job? Okay. When it comes to the concession, the motion to vacate about one person being able to make that motion, how long has that been in the rules? Forever. The only time it was changed is when Pelosi became speaker the second time. And she put the power with the minority leader. I think it's wrong. I think you could like to let, let them govern. Now it takes 218 to have the rule package. There's nothing I can do there. But I had five people who never voted for me anyways in the process. I had eight at the end that did the other. But everybody had to live by it. I lived by it. I think today if you went back to the people that voted, they think that was a smart vote. I don't think so. I had the choice of having that vote of motion to vacate where you just put the cards in and walk away. No, I made everybody stand up. Because I think historically, it'll be viewed as a very bad thing that happened to our Congress. Do you think it happens again? I mean, there's now no. talk that it could happen to this speaker. No. Two things. The Dems will never let it happen. The interesting part is, you want another, another, want another inside story? Okay. Not this crowd. So, so I knew I needed to win the majority by 20 votes or I'd have a problem. So I knew on election night I had a problem. But I had tried for speaker before and I, I made a bad interview and I had to pull out. But as leader, I had never lost a race. I helped us win a majority. I expanded that. I thought I was best prepared for the job. So then people tried to come and push it and I kept going. And I remember I was, Pelosi was speaker at the time. The election was over, I was here and we were at a meeting. And she goes, have you put the votes together? Well, yeah. I said, no, I got this problem. You know, they want to come back with a motion to vacate. Oh, give it to them. Just give it to them. I, I told Boehner. I told Paul. We'll never vote for that. We'll table that every time. No, oh, whatever. Um, but when it came time, I guess she changed her mind. Um, but when we went through the fight, I had to go through 15 rounds. Right? I'm Irish, we box, it's okay. Um, that only happened since the Civil War. But I think it was a point that if 96% of the conference decides this is the person, why are you allowing 4% to do something else? You won't be able to govern. No disrespect, it's not about me being gone, but because those eight who partnered all with the Democrats, you see the conference is in disarray, right? Because there's no consequences, there's no rules. What if 96% of the country said, this person won election, but four people said, no, I'm never going to support him, so that person can't serve? Well, who, in a democracy and in a republic, who has the power then? Two standing mics start to line up. We're going to go to your questions very shortly. I've got a lot more that I haven't gotten to, so I may try to sprinkle them in periodically. Um, also, let me know where you're from, what you're studying. Um, but before, as you guys are lining up, just staying on this thread for a moment, Marjorie Taylor Greene is threatening to try to do to Speaker Johnson the same thing, and it's around Ukraine funding. So my question is, should the House fund, speaking of democracy, should the House vote to give aid to Ukraine? <laughs> Because if they don't, President Zelensky has said they will lose the war. And if they do, does Speaker Johnson lose his job? Now, see, this is what we should have started with. But OK. Now, lo and behold, Mar what Marjorie Taylor Greene is doing is not the same thing as Matt Gates did. Just so you know, inside politics, OK? There's different ways to introduce a motion. You can make it privileged so it has to come up. You have to have that vote. Marjorie Taylor Greene did not do that. So it's not exactly the same. What she's doing is raising an issue, which as a legislator has a right to do. And if you read through what she's saying is, and I've always found this with Marjorie, you should sit down and talk to her. She's not rigid if you, you sit and make cases. You, sh you can come to an agreement. And remember, our government is designed that one party doesn't control all. You've got to have compromise. It's just the way the, uh, our government is set up. Now, 
I am really worried what the world looks like. And you should be worried. For all, anybody in here a history major? It looks like 1930s. When's the last time you had an axis of evil of partner together to fight democracies? Iran, Russia, China, and North Korea. You had Italy, Germany, and Japan. When was the last time you had somebody, if you look at Putin, he's done many of the exact same actions as Hitler. You know, Hitler served in the German army in World War I. He hated that his leadership signed the Treaty of Versailles. So much when World War II, when they took France, he brought the same rail car back that they signed it in. And what did Hitler do? He created a new party and he ran in a democracy again and again and again until he took power, then he changed it. Then he went directly against the Treaty of Versailles and he rebuilt his military. But the world power said nothing because they thought he'd keep the communists at bay. Then what did he do? He took part of Czechoslovakia, right? Took Austria. And then what did he do? He created the axis of evil. Then he told the entire world he was going to take the rest of Czechoslovakia on a given day. So the world power could no longer ignore him. So in comes Neville Chamberlain. Hitler loves it because it equalizes him to the world power. Neville Chamberlain tells the world, peace for our time. He makes him sign a piece of paper. Hitler sees weakness. And plans a year later and invades Poland and World War III begins and the world is changed forever. Putin doesn't serve in the Soviet military, but he serves in the KGB. He hated that his leadership collapsed the Soviet Union to the West. So much so when Gorbachev died two years ago, he wouldn't attend the funeral. What did he do? He learned that a military makes you strong, but dependency makes you weak. He rebuilds his military based upon the natural resources of Russia, an old pipeline that goes through. He uses his KGB tactics to push Europe to actually buy more natural gas. When the, when the powers of Ukraine change, he no longer wants to pay the dividends to them. So what does he do? He proposes a new pipeline, not to go through any country, but to go through the ocean, Nord Stream 2. Merkel says, great. The only country to put sanctions on it is America. What does he do under the offices of President Bush, President Obama? He invades other countries, Georgia. He takes part of the Dunbos. The world power sanctions him at times, but kind of he gets away with it, right? He parks 100,000 troops along the border of Ukraine. Every president's going to get pressured when they come in. He threatens it. But when he got his meeting with Joe Biden, before he got the meeting, he went to the Olympics in China to create the axis, the partnership with China, North Korea, and with Iran. And then what happened at that meeting? Biden lifted all the sanctions of Nord Stream 2, but asked him nothing. He watched the fall of Afghanistan, believed Ukraine would be just as fast. In 2015, I went to Ukraine as a member of Congress, took a bipartisan group. Russia had invaded them. I watched how far the Ukrainian, how tough the Ukrainian people fought for their own defense, but these Russian tanks, they had nothing to defend them with the tanks, but they were still holding them back. So I went to the White House with a bipartisan group to meet with the person in charge of Ukraine. You know who that was? Vice President Joe Biden. I sat in the situation room with Republican and Democrat members, and I advocated, could we sell them javelins, a defensive weapon to stop tanks? Joe Biden at that time told me no. Merkel wouldn't like that. I said, well, let's do this. Let's train them on them and keep it in Poland so we can move them rapidly. He said, no, can't do that. We should fund Ukraine. But from the same purpose, we should secure our own border. Now, I disagree with people in America who said you could only do one or the other. You have a government that you have to find compromise in. There's both parties that want some of both. Why can't you make that agreement that we make every day? I am, I am worried if Putin is successful, you're going to get this push everywhere else as well. Let's get to student questions, and I'll sprinkle in occasionally. Yes. Your name, what you're studying, what year, year you are, I'll and where you're from. I'll go later people are still asking. 
Nice to meet you, Mr. McCarthy. Nice My name is Anjan. I'm from Tom Kane Junior's District in New Jersey, and um, I'm studying science policy in the School of Foreign Service. I'm a first year. Excellent. Um, I appreciate your comments, especially what you just said about Ukraine. Um, my question is about bipartisanship, and in particular in the Senate, not in the House. A lot of major bipartisan members of the Senate are leaving. In 2024, Mitt Romney, Kirsten Sinema, Joe Manchin, John Tester might be on the rocks, who knows. But my point is, um, even though we are a very polarized country right now politically, on the face of things, these members of the Senate have been pushing through a lot of bipartisan legislation, which might stave off the effects of polarization in the actual body. So what do you think the future of bipartisan legislation looks like in the Senate once these members leave? Look, the Senate is always bigger than one person. I, I like everybody you talked about. I, I, would, um, I would work out with Kristen Sinema. I think she's very smart and does an amazing job. People leave for a lot of reasons. But the number one people leave, leave or don't run for re-election is when they can't win. Okay? So it's back in your own district whether you determine that. You're always going to have bipartisanship. And just because a bill is, says it's bipartisan, that doesn't mean it's good. I call a bill bipartisan all the time because I got one person on the other side. But our government is designed to have compromise, right? So what you really want, what I love, I love the old school house rock. I want a bill that goes through committee because you're going to have debates on all sides. You know, when I became speaker, it was the first time in seven years we had what was called an open rule, which you probably think happens every day. Think about it, seven years. All four years of, of Speaker Pelosi and of the time of Paul Ryan. Never did a bill come to the floor where any member in Congress can offer an amendment. You represent all these people. Why can't they have a voice? And so I think it's more the structure that's broken down. But the reason why I think the names that you said are not running, we're not rewarding that type of work. Right? So um, how we get our news, I think, is a big problem. So you, you would all sit here and I'd ask you, or who's your favorite people? Or do you want, what do you want in elected official? You'd say, I want somebody who works with both sides of the aisle. But that's not what shows up in the ballot box. And we also have so many races that aren't competitive anymore, so it's all about a primary. So then on both sides are going further the other way that makes it harder there. But look, our government's designed this way. It's been worse in other days. Um, it's, it's more about redistricting inside the House, but the Senate, there is no redistricting. You have the whole state, so you, you'll see it. It'll, it'll rock back and forth, but look, cinema, if you looked at her early career, wasn't there. If you, if you look at Mitt Romney when he was running for president, he wasn't the same Mitt Romney whether he was today. Um, there's one book I'd, I'd recommend for you all. Well, there's a lot I'd recommend you to read. But any of you read Adam Grant's Think Again? It's a great book. I like Adam. Adam's a professor. You will have a philosophical belief right now. But if you have this philosophical belief and you only have this much of the information and you get new information and you change your opinion, is that wrong? No. I think that's intellectual. And you should challenge yourself on that. But in today's society, if somebody got more information and said, oh, I have a different opinion on this, the country would go after you. No, you want to start rewarding that. So, thank you. Thanks. Tom Kane's doing a great job, too. Let's go over here. Hello. Uh, thank you for coming and answering questions. My name is Quan. Um, I'm studying government. I'm a senior. Um, under, you talked a little bit about um, hanging chads and inconsistencies across the country when it comes to elections. But under your leadership, uh, the Republican Party blocked at every turn Democratic attempts to standardize elections across the country. And you yourself, after January 6th, you went down to Mar-a-Lago and you stood beside a person who, after many frivolous lawsuits were thrown out, you said, this is still the guy that should be leading our party. So do you feel that you have turned your back on democracy to any degree? Okay. Thank you for the question. <laughs> now, most are this whole place by saying we have a distrust in democracy. So if I let your question stand and just answer it the way it was, then people would think what you said was true. Okay, so, so that's unfair, so I have to challenge you back, not, not in a disrespectful way. So your first premise is that we denied any election change in my leadership, that answer is no. 
We actually proposed a lot. I was in the minority at the time. We couldn't get through. If you look at my job as speakership, yeah, we ran a whole new bill that was going through that opened it up more. You said I stood and said something. Well, that's not true. Did I go to Mar-a-Lago? Yes, but that had, I didn't say that at Mar-a-Lago for that basis, right? So that's not true. I also have another philosophy. Whether I like you or dislike you, if something bad happens in your life, I want to be the first person to call you. Because the one thing I learned in life is we have too many Facebook friends. We don't have real friends. And the first thing that happens when something bad happens in your life, everybody abandons you. I want to call you, not to help you, what to do, I just want to know how you're doing as a person. And I, I'll do that on both sides of the aisle. I don't pick from anything else. I just think as a person of who I am, I'm going to do that. Now you can play anything you want into me going to Mar-a-Lago, but I simply got a phone call and I was down there doing a fundraiser. Would I come by and see the president? Yeah. Did I think all the attention would go out? No. You want the backstory behind that one too? Okay, so I, I get asked if I could come by and see, look, I like President Trump. We have good relationships. We yell at each other at times. We have bad relationships at times. Um, but my relationship with him is I don't criticize him on TV because I don't think it makes any difference, but I'll tell him exactly what I think back and forth. Because I think that's a respectful thing to do. I think he needs to hear. And lots of times he hears things from me he might not want to do. But if I'm going to be a real friend, I should tell him exactly what I think. Um, and we had had some heated conversations prior to this. And they asked if I'd come by and see him. He was out. I was, happened to be in Palm Beach at that time. And they asked if I'd come for dinner. I can't come for dinner. I'll come by lunch. So um, I say, yeah. Like 30 minutes later, the New York Times has it. I thought I was just going by and no one's going to know, right? And so um, now the press is all around, right? So they're trying to build something into it. So when I go in, I sit down for lunch. The first thing the president says, he goes, uh, did you leak this? I said, no, I didn't, I didn't tell him. Did your staff leak this? No, I didn't even tell my staff. You think my staff leaked this? I said, no, no. no. He said, who do you think leaked it? You. <laughs> and he looks at me and goes, well, it's good for both of us, you know. You know, these cameras are <laughs> But you endorsed him this time. Yeah. You endorsed him before the Iowa caucus. Yeah. So despite everything that happened post-January 6th and everything that we've been talking about, you still think he is the best person to lead our democracy. I think he is much better than our current President Joe Biden. And you, let, let, let me make my case. Right? We could have a strong difference of opinion. We, we yeah, have different and, and philosophies. We do, but... That's easy. Yeah. <laughs> That's easy. But... but but let's go through this. I have, I have served under both. And I have watched what happened in Afghanistan never should have happened. I'm in the Gang of Eight. I get the exact same briefings. The decisions that were made on how we left Americans behind, the 13 goals, everything else, is going to set our country back for the next two decades. It's moved our allies closer to China and everywhere else. Inflation. That last bill drove us there. And I'm sorry, not one of you has sat in the room that I know of and negotiated bills with the current president. This is different than being the mayor. This is different than anything else. This is the leader of the free world. I sit with other foreign leaders. I know what they say when they sit with President Biden. And I'm sorry. Even if, even if this entire room is Democrats and wants to vote for a Democrat, if I asked you privately, you'd all pick somebody else too, wouldn't you? This is serious. There is a higher probability in simple statistics as someone here in math that if Joe Biden is elected, that he can't carry out his entire presidency. I also know who is running on our side. So I don't have a choice of other. When I made a decision, it was who was left. Do I think who would do the best job? Yeah, I've seen it. I know where we'd be stronger. I know where we would be. We've evacuated five embassies. We've got war in Europe. One of our greatest strengths is our natural resources. Do you know 
American natural gas. How did Russia become so strong? They sold their natural gas to Europe. Do you realize if we replace American natural gas with Russian natural gas, just in Europe for one year, we'd lower CO2 emissions by 218 million tons? One year. American natural gas is 40% cleaner. And this president just stopped our ability to sell more of it. What does that do to our economy? What does it do to the world environment? So I've served with both people. It's not a, it's not a hard decision for me. Because I think I'm making my vote based upon the America I want to leave for you. And I think you'll have less opportunity. We've got a debt crisis that's going to hit us and we can no longer ignore it. We've got a president who's making politics out of Medicare and Social Security and won't let you debate it. You can't do that. We've got to wake up. We're all in this together. So you can criticize me about who I want and have a different opinion. I'll respect your opinion. But the one thing I want in America is that we respect each other's opinion. And you come from your opinion based upon your beliefs. But also remember, the other person comes from their beliefs. And the great thing about our country is we can believe something different. But we build that based upon our own experiences. And I will just tell you, based upon my experiences working with both men, it's not a hard decision. Let's go to the next student question. Hi, Speaker McCarthy. Uh, thank you for speaking with us today. Uh, my name is Ben Doolin. I'm a senior in the college from New York, majoring in physics and classics. And my question for you is, in light of recent failure to pass bipartisan border legislation and military aid for Ukraine after former President Trump opposed the bill, do you see a single individual's power to effectively derail bipartisan consensus building as a threat to the functioning of our legislative branch of government? Well, you would say then Trump has the power of what comes to the floor or not. It's the speaker that has the power. And I don't know who influenced the speaker. Maybe Trump did or not. But this is what I would do, having been in that job. I had a very difficult situation. Shoot. Winning speaker you thought was tough. I knew after I was winning speaker, I had the debt ceiling. That's a serious issue. You could shut government down. That's not a big deal. But you can't fault on the debt ceiling. As speaker, you've got to have a strategy. Now, you would all think this would be the best way. Why don't you bring the four leaders together and solve it? Wouldn't that sound nice? Well, that's really the wrong thing to do as a speaker. Because remember, I'm sitting with a majority of six. The Democrats control the Senate, and the Democrats control the White House. You have to, if you're the majority, you've got to use the majority. So I said, I'm only going to negotiate with the president. Because that's the best deal I'm going to get. Because the president will probably agree to things that Hakeem and Schumer never could. But if the president agrees to it, Hakeem and Schumer have to vote for it. So I go and see the president. I sit down with him in February and say, look, let's not play games with this. I want to come to an agreement. There's certain things I can do, certain things not. Let's talk about it. And let's not put the country in chaos and let's work together. He said, yeah, yeah, good idea. Well, Schumer got to him. And I don't, I don't, I'd probably do the same thing. I said, don't do that with Kevin. He's got a six-seat majority. He's got 20 people who have never voted for a debt ceiling. He can't pass anything. Just push it up to the deadline. He'll fold. Smart move. But I said no. So I'd go to the press every day, talk about it. Then I got my conference to vote for something. 48 hours, 48 hours later, he calls. Let's meet, right? But what does he do? Smart move on his part. He brings the other leaders. Why? Because they can say no. I say, well, Kevin, I can't do anything. You know, you gotta. So what do I do then? I've got to blow the meeting up. And it's, it's part of a strategy. You wouldn't like it. I mean, after that first meeting in the Oval, the president says, there were three very professional leaders and one that was kind of a jerk. That was me. But it was my strategy. I had to get the others out of the room, right? So I could negotiate one-on-one. -on -one. Now, if you look at the end of the day, what we agreed to, two trillion in cut, the largest ever. Welfare reform. NEPA reform. Haven't done in four years. These are things you never would have gotten if you sat there with bipartisan leaders, because everybody could be no about something, right? I think if you look at when you're successful, usually divided government helps you to be successful. If you go back to Bill Clinton and Newt Gingrich, they balanced the budget. Because they were both at a certain position where they had strength, but they had to come together so they could use the other side. Now, what should have happened 
And if I was still leader, it would have, speaker, it still would have happened. It would have happened the next month. I want to do Ukraine, but I knew Ukraine was very important to the president, too. So what I did when I did the um, funding the government, if you noticed, I added disaster in there. Because we just had a terrible fire in Hawaii. Remember that in Maui? How were the others? Well, I wanted that out of anybody's utilizing it. I wanted Ukraine by itself with the border. And I don't care where you are, the border's a problem. Do you know how many Chinese dissidents we caught so far this year? Just the ones that we caught. 22,000. You go back two years before, it'd be like 200. Do you know, anybody on here on the terrorist watch list? I would assume no, right? Pretty hard to get on it, right? Do you know, in the last February, we caught more people on the terrorist watch list in one month than we had caught in the last four years? If you don't know who's coming across, you've got a problem. I believe Democrats, and I don't just believe it, I know it because they'd come to me, please do something on the border for us because it'll save me in my election, right? They don't have the willpower to vote for something on their own, but if it was in a package together. So the speaker should go and sit down with the president and just negotiate it out like we did the debt ceiling and bring it directly to the floor. That's a sign of strength from both positions, and that's what should happen. Thank you. Thanks. Let's go over here. Thank you, Speaker McCarthy. My name is Jason Goodman. I'm a Master of Public Policy and MBA student from Los Angeles and a fellow Dodger fan. All right. I went to Korea to watch him play uh, the Padres. Awesome. Um, <laughs> that was opening day. Former President Trump often uses rhetoric that immigrants are poisoning the blood of our country, like Hitler, who I know you referenced earlier. Can you explain why you believe that a leader who uses such inflammatory rhetoric about immigrants is the best person to lead our country? Now, I don't know if he said that exact quote. I'm not going to challenge it. I don't know if he said yeah, that. Yeah, it's many times. But I, 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 I have ne I've never heard him say that. Um, look, my grandfather came from Italy. My great-grandfather came from Italy. We, we are a country based upon immigrants. All bases. It, it's a strength within our nation that we, we unite together. Um, so you want to weigh that with a president who doesn't secure the border at all, who anybody can come through. You know, I got hanging in my office the Ellis Island papers of my grandfather coming here at age 14. Yeah? Guido Palladino, asking for a better life. We should have a system that actually works. I'm ne if you want to rate me because I support somebody and you've got to go through 100% of what they say, I can come back with all these things about Joe Biden and you're going to support him. Nobody's perfect in life. I'm a member of Congress. I'm able to vote what I think is improper or what is proper. I also think the country is based upon our laws and our rules. So, yeah, people could have a difference of opinion, but I don't think that's what President Trump believes my time around him. Never heard it. Hi, Speaker McCarthy. Uh, my name is Callie Wicker. Um, I'm studying computer science and political science. Um, and I just wanted to ask why, um, on, when did you find out that, about Trump's fake electorate scheme and why did you not do anything to stop it? So. When did I find out about the fake electorate scheme? Yes. I didn't know that he had a fake electorate scheme. Uh, I met with him after the election. Um, I talked about what to do, where to, do with the, where to put the library. You can run later and the next time. Um, so I don't know of a scheme. I've never found out about a scheme. So from that perspective, I don't know. I think we've got time for one. I'll stay a little longer if they keep asking. I don't have a job anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go over here. Hello. Uh, Michael Sanis, I'm from uh, McHenry's district. Uh, so, oh, Patrick, good man. So I, I do, I have a fun question, a uh, serious question. The fun one will be, why did you pick uh, McHenry? That's cool. Um, and then the, this could also be fun, is, uh, um, so we, we talked about democracy and the threats to democracy, and you have the weaponization committee that you did in yes. the beginning. Can you talk about the weaponization of the judiciary system, uh, the $90 million that President Trump has had to pay for legal fees, and how that can be a threat to democracy? Well, you know, it's a good discussion. And if you guys are willing to have it, we, we could come back and have this. Because when you think a threat to democracy, 
I imagine most here go right to January 6th. Would that be fair? Is that fair? Okay, so let me ask you this question. Is it a threat to democracy if you keep somebody off a ballot? Just because you don't like them? I think that's a big threat to democracy. You know that's been happening in this election? Is it a threat to democracy if you use the court system to try to stop somebody? Well, some could be right, some would be wrong, but I would think, you'd think some of these cases seem like it's happening that way when you ask the people like that. that that's a debate on all sides. Um, the weaponization committee was really created to go to the heart of your first question about democracy itself. If people are on all sides believing we've got a problem, if you just ignore it, it gets worse. So I created a committee, and another committee I created was the Select Committee on China, which has been an excellent committee. I, I want to frame that after I answer this one too. But get to the core. L Democrats can appoint whoever they want. I sit down with Hakeem beforehand, tell him what I'm going to do, who I want to put serious people on there. But what's interesting, what's very concerning, Elon Musk happens to be a friend of mine because we've done a lot of work about space. And I would say, in our relationship, starting out, he would come to me and say, oh, a lot of my friends think you're the devil, Kevin, but I tell them you're still nice, right? Because I was conservative, they were not. I think the guy's to the right at me sometimes now, right? But he buys Twitter and he wants to come see me. He watches, which he never believed government was using to go after people. Just, we think, oh, there's some bad people. No, paying them millions of dollars. What about this? Is it a threat to democracy? If there is a major story that comes out from a major newspaper and people who served in the intel and government from the CIA director and others tell you it's Russia falsity right before an election and then utilize social media to say you cannot reprint or post a newspaper article. Would that be a threat to democracy? That happened in the last election. And you know what happened after the election? Everything they said, they came back and said, oh no, it's not true. That really is Hunter Biden's laptop. And those 51 people who have top security clearance, when you ask them, why did you say that? Well, the guy who's the Secretary of State today, who wasn't Secretary of State then, but was helping in the campaign, called me and told me to write it down. That's a threat to democracy. So, you got to bring it up. Patrick McHenry. Did you watch him being speaker? He was pretty good, right? Bang that gavel down harm. Okay. So when you become speaker, you have to put a letter in for if something was to happen to you, right? And the whole idea before was this person's going to just hang over and be able to do it. So I had put a list in, and I couldn't rate everybody down. And nobody knows. Nobody knows it. Nobody sees what it is. Now you all know because you had to open it. Patrick wasn't my first one. I, mean, I had him on the list, but I didn't think it was first. I didn't think it was ever going to be used. Two weeks prior, when I figured this was going to happen, I figured they were going to win, I called Patrick one night. And I also thought in different ways. I thought, okay, if this happens, I don't think the Dems will help me. I'm going to be in a fight. And I thought at the time, all right, I'm going to go back to the 15 rounds. So I'm thinking strategically, right? Who do I want in the chair, but also who do I want on the floor working? But whoever holds that chair... I want to pick the very best person that I would say, what if something really did happen and that person has to be the speaker? Patrick by McHenry by far. They would have done a smart move when they couldn't decide who to be speaker just to keep him in there. He, he's been in leadership, he's been in chairman. If you watched how he governed in a very fair manner, um, and I think most people would look back and say that exact same thing. Thank you. Something you just said reminded me of something that was in the news over the weekend. Chairman McCall of Foreign Affairs and Chairman Turner of Intelligence both over the weekend came out and said that Russian propaganda has, quote, infected a good chunk of the GOP base. These are two Republican chairs. They're seeing it on conservative media, and they're even seeing it on the House floor. Do you agree with them? Well, they're referring to Ukraine, what somebody are making the argument yes. back to Ukraine. Yes, specifically about yeah, Ukraine. Yeah, I think what, what's happening here is you see, Russia will put things out, well, this is happening in Ukraine, and someone repeats it by not checking it. That happens, there's other countries doing that stuff to us every day. But what I think, listen, there's a, there's a lot of problems right now. 
But I'd also say, if you are the leader of America, and you think Ukraine is very important, you should speak to America about it. What's happening is, members, members are reflective of their district, right? The Senate is like the wealthiest country club in the world. You ever go over to the Senate, it's pristine, there's no real visitors. The House is like having breakfast at a truck stop, okay? <laughs> We are a microcosm of society, and we're, we're closer. We're very reflective of what our district's saying. So they're getting that feedback. They're getting, hey, don't know that. I think it's incumbent upon the president. He should be doing, like, in the history of America, have these fireside chats. Tell America why is Ukraine important. You know what? 9-11 happened before some of you were even born. But it came from a foreign land that America thought wasn't that important to care about. But they prove to us, if we ignore certain things, it'll reach us. And there is a reason why America should lead, okay? There's not one American man or woman in uniform dying in Ukraine. But if we allow Russia to come in and take another country, why can't China just go take something the next day? Why can't Iran? And if you want to be the leader of the free world and you bring everybody else together and somebody else is willing to fight. And the other thing that people don't quite understand, how many of you think that money goes to Ukraine? Nobody? So where does it go? You know where that money goes? The majority of the money doesn't go to Ukraine. It goes to replenish our own weapons because we depleted them all. So if you don't fund it, you've made America weaker. So we shipped them the weapons, and now we got to go rebuild the weapons so we can protect ourselves. I wouldn't want to leave us in a weaker position. But why isn't somebody out there telling us that? Why doesn't the president, if he wants to talk to America, every network will carry it and say, this is important. I know there's an election coming up, but I have a job to look out for you. And you know what's happening in Ukraine? Just as happening in the rest of the world. It's becoming spring, and fighting's going to get bigger. And we're losing ground to what we've taken before. And we told Putin that he couldn't do this. Because why doesn't he go to the Baltics next? We've watched world history where wars have been created this way. And you know this money we're talking about? is to replenish our weapons. So we're protected, so somebody doesn't think we're vulnerable to attack us again. And don't look that far back. Just go back to 9-11, when we thought, we could ignore other parts of the world, they attacked us. And you know what? Those terrorist groups are growing again. And we shouldn't look weak at this moment. Mr. Speaker, unfortunately, we're about to Time. get kicked out of this room. So you come down and ask look, a question. I, we have profound disagreements on many issues. When I was at the DNC, I think I wrote a few press releases hitting you over the head. But, I still won. Uh, <laughs> But I am so appreciative that you would come here to Georgetown to have a free-flowing conversation with me, but more importantly, to take our student questions. That's why we exist. And so thank you for, for coming. Right, thank you. <laughs>